Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Thursday. And of course, we are still sorting through the fallout from Tuesday's elections and speculating about whether the the midterm environment might have changed. But one of the most interesting developments over the last several weeks, at least interesting to me, has been the emergence of a third party or a third movement, the Forward Party. And so joining me on the podcast today to talk about this, Governor Christine Todd Whitman, former governor of the state of New Jersey, and Andrew Yang, former Democratic presidential candidate. They are the co-chairs of Forward, this new party. So first of all, Governor Andrew, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. And there are four of us, actually, who are co-chairs. Okay. So, well, we have two co-chairs, at least on the podcast today. So I guess, look, you've gotten a lot of attention for this. And uh, I think it's fair to say that there has been a lot of skepticism and there's been a lot of criticism and there are a lot of questions about what you are up to. You all wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post talking about this as a viable alternative, explaining that while most third parties fail, you don't think yours will. So let's start with that, the case you're making for why the forward party will not suffer the fate of virtually every other third party uh, that we've seen in American political history. Who wants to go first? I'll take a shot at it because there are a lot of numbers in there, Charlie. So the fact is right now the appetite for a third party has literally never been higher. 50% of Americans self-identify as independents. 62% want a third party. And I'm sure most of the listeners to the bulwark have been despairing about what the heck has happened to common sense leadership, to, to legislators who can come across the aisle and work together. And I'm going to tell you all, it's getting worse, not better. You have to look in the mirror and say, okay, we subscribe to the bulwark. We like Charlie. We like reason. And you look up and you see that all of the political incentives are to push people to the sides, to amplify the extremes. The media, and we all know this, the media doubles down on this. And then social media makes it all exponentially worse. So the question is, what is the way out? And the only answer is a positive, unifying third party movement. The forward party will succeed because this is exactly what tens of millions of Americans have been waiting for, including, I'm sure, most of the people who listen to the bulwark. Yeah, when you have two thirds of Americans saying, of registered Democrats, registered Republicans saying they'd consider a third party, you know you're in a different world than you've been in the past. And what we're saying is look, Americans can generally be brought together around a commitment to economic opportunity to personal liberty or independence, and a defense of democracy. And from there, we can build on the other issues. We're starting something entirely new. We're starting from the ground up. We're concentrating and focusing on those 500,000 elective positions that there are around the country. And in 2020 election, 70% of those were uncontested. So your slogan is not left, not right, forward but you haven't announced specific policies. And this is one of the big questions that you've heard out there. People saying, how can you have a political party that doesn't take positions on issues that has no platform? So what does not left, not right forward mean, Andrew Yang? Well, the the great thing is, Charlie, is most Americans know exactly what it means, where you can line up issue after issue and there is a common sense majority position on most of them. Uh, and the, the fact is, right now, our legislators can't come together because if they do, many of them fear they'll lose their jobs. A Republican senator said to me that an issue is worth more to them unaddressed than addressed. And you all know exactly what I'm talking about. So not left, not right forward is we will actually do what's in the interest of the American people, according to the will of the American people. And you can look at issue after issue and see that there is 65, 70 percent consensus view on a lot of it, and yet it won't get done, which is why everyone is in despair all the time. The congressional approval rate is 20%, but the re-election rate is 94%. That's a broken system. And the reason why it's so high is that the two parties have carved our country up like a turkey. 90% of the districts are uncompetitive in the general. There is no real contest of ideas happening, and it will not happen without an effort like the forward party. So what do you stand for? I mean, I agree with you in terms of the structural systemic problems that we have, but a political party has to have a set of beliefs. Are you center right? Are you center left? Where do you come down on government spending, economic growth, uh, corporate taxes, school choice, right to work laws, the right to life? Do you you have an, an agenda at all, Governor Whitman? 
Charlie, our, our agenda is to hear from the American people. And we're going to be starting in September to go around the country and have listening forums where we ask people, what do you think are the major issues? Not what we tell you they are. What do you think? And how do you want to approach them? And then next summer, we're going to have a convention where we will adopt a platform. But, you know, I've been trying, racking my brains. I've been a Republican for a long time and been going to conventions and all sorts of things. And my parents were both very involved. And I don't remember when party platforms started to change, but originally they were not specific on every single issue. They were more broad statements of how they were going to approach issues rather than demanding that everyone believe a certain way on, on any one of the issues, abortion, gun rights. And as Andrew has pointed out on many occasions, and we've all seen it and I've seen it and worked with it, when you get people together you can find ways to find consensus around these issues, not all the way. You're not going to get everybody to agree on everything. But when people start to talk and actually polls show us today that we're not as far apart as we're being told we are uh, on the actual issues themselves. We're just being told we have to hate one another if we don't agree. And, and Charlie, we, we are in a context where one of the two major parties literally doesn't have a platform. So, I mean, reflect right. on that for exactly. a moment. <laughs> And nobody's well, yes. calling them out. <laughs> but are there non-negotiables? Are there positions that the forward party will take, for example, on electoral reform, democracy, the rule of law? Are there some bottom lines here that would help people understand who you are and what you represent? I mean, you hit on them, Charlie. We're doing this in large right. part to reform and modernize our democracy itself. So we are non-negotiable on the fact that elections matter, Americans should be able to vote, we should be able to agree on the results. Um, a, a lot of this effort is meant to try and restore a degree of integrity to our society, to our country, to our, our faith in elections. And we're, we're in a country where 42% of Democrats and Republicans alike view the other side as corrupt and a threat to the country. And we all know that in that context, if you have an election result, people will look at it uh, and millions of Americans uh, are going to question whether their vote was counted. We need a genuinely open competitive system that includes nonpartisan open primaries and ranked choice voting so that different points of view can actually compete. Because right now, again, 90% of the country is essentially one party rule, much less two party rule. And that's those are things we won't back away from. We're not backing away from some of the things that we want to see, like ranked choice voting, mm -hmm. open primaries. We very strongly believe that everyone who is, has legal right to vote should be able to vote. We should make it as easy as possible for them to vote. And those are things that, that we stand strong on. Listen, Charlie, I want to dig into this because I think it's sure. really important. I ran for president as a Democrat, had viewpoints on just about everything under the sun. And you have to ask yourself, what is this government, this two-party system actually going to deliver? And the answer is not a whole heck of a lot. The fact is... Uh, these policy standpoints have become tribal markers and abstractions more than any signal of what you're actually going to do because the system will not do anything. So what we have to do is actually be honest, say a restoration of the system is a precursor to any real policy movement and a change in incentive so that if legislators do deliver a policy compromise, they will not lose their jobs. The number one question that I'm sure that you've gotten and that I hear a lot of is, are, are you going to be spoilers? I mean, traditionally, third parties have not thrived under our two-party system. I mean, you, you've had, you know, Ross Perot in 92, Ralph Nader in 2000. People will bring up Jill Stein in 2016 saying that, you know, they, they, kind of, they spoiled the system. And I think there's a lot of fear among Democrats right now and, you know, other anti-Trump folks that a third party um, might throw the 2024 election to Donald Trump. So can you address that whole criticism that a third party would be a spoiler? Yes. I mean, first of all, what's to spoil? The system isn't working terribly well for people right now. But secondly, um, you're talking from the premise and the assumption that what we're about is the 2024 mm -hmm. presidential election. We're not. We're about the 500,000 elective positions across the country that often mean more to people in their everyday lives than do the Senate or the House or the presidency even. Your mayor, your council, your governor, your secretary of state, your state attorney general. That's where our focus is. We may not have a candidate in 2024. Who knows that uh, for president? That's not what our aim is. Our aim is to start filling those other positions all the way up 
the ballot. And then if we have one, fine. But we're also here there for the long term. If we don't have everything, and we probably won't have everything in place by 2024 in terms of all 500,000 offices, 2026, 2028. I mean, we're not going away. We're here for the long haul. We understand what it takes to do that. As the governor said, our goal is to be on the ballot in 15 states at the end of this year, 30 states by the end of 23, and then all 50 states by 2024 to help with those local races that will make such a big difference in Americans' lives. And one race that I would call people's attention to, Charlie, that I know I'm sure you're a fan of, is Evan McMullen. I was just going to ask you about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah where he's an independent running for U.S. Senate against a Trumper, Mike Lee. And to us, that's exactly the kind of candidate that Americans of any alignment, independent or otherwise, should be getting behind. So we're backing Evan McMullen. So while other people are fixated on, oh, 2024, like we're trying to get work done. That's the ethos of the forward party. I will say, too, that the entire spoiler effect argument is intellectually disingenuous because if you were really concerned about it, you would just implement ranked choice voting and problem solved. But no one actually is trying to solve the problem. What they're trying to do is use it as a cudgel to suppress any competition. So Stuart Rothenberg, who has been a longtime political analyst and not a hardcore partisan, wrote this week that looking at the reform party, he says, what we have here is a bunch of gobbledygook. That's what he described it. He said he pointed out in this column he wrote for Roll Call that many people may call themselves independents, but but in reality, they lean to one party or another, you know, closet partisans who vote like strong partisans. So he writes, it's not surprising that people would say we need another party. Huge numbers think the country's on the wrong track. Biden and Trump have awful poll numbers. But there's a huge difference between a hypothetical party and a real party. And then he's he's raising these questions. You know, what is the party going to stand for, particularly in Republican circles? Moderates keep losing uh, these primaries. The Republican Party seems to be going more right. So, again, how, how do you respond to all of that, uh, that that in fact, People may say they like it, but, you know, the reality is, is that we really are entrenched in, in, a, in a duopoly. Well, there are two things, Charlie. It's true. The two major parties are what are controlling the dialogue now. But if you look, except for the last presidential, after that, while the voter turnout there was good, after that in the primaries and the next elections, it dropped off unbelievably. And it's only when you get an issue like the abortion issue in Kansas that you start to get the huge voter turnout again. And that's the problem. People are turning away from the polls, which is exactly the wrong response because of what they their choices. And this is all coming from the from the people who have done things the old way. And we're talking about doing things a different way. Actually, in many ways, getting back to what the parties did before, where it was okay to be a conservative or a moderate or a liberal Republican or Democrat. You all fit under the umbrella of the core principles that drove that party. That's what we're trying to get back to. We can agree on core principles. We're going to have platforms after we're going to have a platform after we have our convention that will get into more issues, but we're not going to be the kind of party that says you have to believe this or you're not one of us. You know, Charlie, I want to say that the point about the corruption of the Republican Party is a direct example of why we need the forward party, because you have the 10% of the most rabid, hyper partisans who are very extreme and not actually representative of the mainstream point of view driving one of our two major parties. Uh, you know, there are similar or like asymmetrical, but there are distortions in the, de the Democratic side as well. We have a, a broken system that disproportionately empowers folks who are on the extremes. Uh, and so when someone looks up and says, oh, there aren't real independents because the Republican Party has lost its mind, that's freaking exhibit A for why you need <laughs> the reforms we're describing. And the, the, the intellectual honesty of our approach is to say, look, like if you change the dial so that they actually have to respond to the majority of the American people, that actually is going to create a massive uh, shift in the legislative approach and the executive approach mm. and the responsiveness, you know, like everything else, if I stood up and said, Hey, I'm for this, I'm for that. It's all nonsense. It's all garbage at this point, because all I'm doing is I'm going to take this slice. I'm going to lose that slice while the two party system continues to grind us into dust. Like this is the only intellectually honest approach out of this. The blue dog Democrats aren't doing so well either. They're getting to be fewer and fewer. That's why Andrew's absolutely right. The, the system's eating itself. Well, I'm going to come back to what's going on with the Democrats in a moment. We spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about Republicans, but I'm going to go through some of this, this criticism again. 
on this very granular level, you know, one New York Times columnist says that this forward party is trying to take the conflict out of politics. He writes, no, we can't. When an issue becomes live, when it becomes salient, as political scientists put it, people disagree. The question is how to handle and structure that disagreement within the political system. So are you trying to take the conflict out of politics? Is that sort of a naive point of view? Uh, when, in, when in fact, we, we do have fundamental value clashes that, that aren't reconcilable just simply by sitting down and talking with one another, reaching across the divide and compromising? I wouldn't say that any of us are naive. We've all been there. <laughs> We've made things happen. And frankly, I've found very directly, I've done it a couple of times, both as governor and as head of EPA, when you bring people together who supposedly don't agree on anything, if you can get them to agree that this is an issue and sit them down in a room and say, okay, let's come up with a way to solve it, you can get there. I've seen it. I've done it. I haven't done it. I've gotten people to do it by putting them together. But you know, this can happen to say that we can't, you have to remember back, the parties used to be able to work together. Were they partisan? Were there harsh words exchanged in the Senate and the House and in the state houses? Of course there were. But then they went out and they had a drink or they had dinner together and they said, okay, we got to solve the problem. And they started yeah. to move things forward. That's what we want to get back to. Yeah, I've got to say, again, that this person is making our argument for us. <laughs> because if, if you see everything as an intractable right or wrong ideological battle, then of course nothing will ever get done. And you need uh, a fulcrum of people in the middle who will say, look, you're on this side, you're on this side. Here's something that's not going to make everyone happy. It'll make some of you somewhat unhappy, but it's the best resolution rather than have this thing go unresolved. Uh, and you can approach issue after issue. The problem right now is the political incentives hue against this. The Democrats right. regularly pass messaging bills that they know won't pass. The Republicans, if they do reach forward. They know they're going to get primaried by their, their crazy base. So, you know, like, 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 I mean, again, this person's making an argument for us. Yeah. OK. So the University of Denver political scientist Seth Maskett also wrote a piece in the, in the Washington Post about why third parties don't succeed. And he says, look, voters can dislike their own party's nominee, but they see the other choice as far, far worse and they don't want to waste their vote or worse, make it easier for the other major party to win. And that's what's happened in election after election after election. People may tell pollsters early on that they're in favor of a third party. But when it comes right down to it, our partisanship is so intense or our tribalization has become so intense that people are more afraid of the other guy and they don't want to feel that they're throwing their vote away. And this hasn't changed, has it? Well, when you start from the ground up the way we are, it makes a huge difference. When you have people in a neighborhood or people in a county who know one another, who are starting to say, look, there is another way. Let's start talking about how we solve some of these issues. You know me. I am not your enemy. I'm your neighbor. Yeah. That's where it's going to make a real difference. And that's why we're approaching it this way. This is interesting because everyone I've heard talk about the Reform Party emphasizes this point where a lot of the critics will focus on the presidential race. You are really focused on local elections um, and, you know, building from the ground up. But, but let me ask you this. If there really was an, um, an, an appetite for a third party or a third way, wouldn't we have seen that, for example, back in 2016 when you were faced with the choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump? Wasn't that the perfect environment for a third party candidate? It didn't happen. And we haven't seen it. So, you know, what's changed since then? Well, everyone listening to this knows that we may be in for the Trump-Biden rematch yes. that no one is asking for. 58% <laughs> of Americans want neither of those men to be president. They haven't gotten better over the last four years. Um, so to me, th this is just a graphic example of the brokenness of the current system in a country of 330 million, that those may be our two choices. And so if you were to present a unity ticket or an independent nomination process, if, as the governor said, we actually decide to, to participate in the 24 election, I think it wins, truly. I mean, uh, you know, 58% of Americans are looking up and saying, no way we're going to run this back. Uh, it, it's just... Uh, you know, the irrationality of a broken two-party system on display. So if there was an alternative, I think it would go very, very far. And are there people that are talking to us about potentially running a, a national campaign? I will be honest and say there are people that are approaching us already because they know if they run in the Republican primary against Trump, they get wrecked. There may or may not be a Democratic primary. And so once again, the nation will be deprived of any meaningful choice and you will wind up with 
the election that nobody wants. Okay, so you don't think that a Biden-Trump race would present voters with a meaningful choice? Oh, you know, a meaningful seems choice pretty meaningful outside to of, me. I mean, no, a, meaning, <laughs> a meaningful choice outside of the two choices forced upon us by a broken two-party system where, again, like no one thinks that an 82-year-old Joe Biden and a 77-year-old Donald Trump are the best we can do. But that's what the two-party system may deliver to us. And that may be the choice. And, and the reality is, though, that, I mean, look who we're, we're talking, you know, the, the kind of people that we're talking to and that we're, we're talking about. These would these are not the the Trump voters. We're, we're we're actually if there was a third party, how how do you answer the people who say you're just basically taking votes away from the Democrats from Joe Biden, making it easier for Donald Trump to be elected, especially in a winner take all system in the Electoral College. Donald Trump is not ever going to win the popular vote. But if there's a third party, then then even a very, very unpopular Donald Trump could become president again with 39, 40 percent of the vote. Who wants to take that risk? Well, first of all, we're once again going right to the presidential, which is not where we are. Mm -hmm. But secondly, and important to know, I think I can speak. And Andrew, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I can speak for all of us. We are not going to be a spoiler if it comes to a Donald okay. Trump, Joe Biden. <laughs> no way. Okay. Uh, none of us want to see Donald Trump back in office. Though, again, this is a symptom of a system. It's it's like uh, you yeah. have a, a vast, diverse country and they say, hey, you're going to spoil it. Just adopt ranked choice voting, problem solved. Anyone can vote for whomever they want, including, yes, in national elections. This is an interesting you know, question about where the center is, because I do think that like on the issue of abortion, for example, the vast majority of Americans are somewhere in the middle, and yet all of the incentives are on the on the extremes. But I wondered whether, and I'm sure you both have thought about this, we have a 50-50 divided Senate, and you could imagine if you would have had centrist Democrats and Republicans and independents form their own caucus, and it only might have been, what, four or five members of that caucus, they could have essentially controlled the United States Senate. They could have forced the Senate to be more bipartisan, to force it to be more moderate. Is that the kind of thing that you're thinking about, that when you think about how the system should work as opposed to, you know, winner take all the Democrats or the Republicans, if you did have a caucus of individuals who would say, we're willing to work on ideas with both parties, but both parties are going to need our votes. Any thoughts about this? Let me tackle this one, Governor. Uh, this is sure. exactly the vision, Charlie, and this vision may come to fruition as early as January of 2023. People talk about the forward party as like, oh, it's going to spoil, it's going to do this. We can help win a Senate race or two. I mean, Evan McMullen's the most obvious one, but are there center centrist senators who are talking to us about joining this fulcrum strategy, which, by the way, would give them control of the legislative agenda? A hundred percent. And this is one reason why we're focused on the here and now while journalists are lazily, you know, painting narratives that are out of date and apply to efforts that have nothing to do with ours. So let me ask you this. We've spent a lot of time talking about the dysfunction of of the Republican Party and how it got to where it is and the way that it has become a cult of personality. Andrew, you were a, a Democratic presidential candidate. You ran for mayor in New York. You have been in the in the belly of the beast of of politics, both national politics and local politics, why did you decide that you were no longer a Democrat? What is the problem that you see in the Democratic Party? And I, I ask this because you know that a lot of our listeners and our colleagues will say that, look, given what's happening with the Republican Party, the only viable alternative is the Democratic Party and that people need to line up behind the Democratic Party as the only viable alternative to Republicans. You obviously have made a different choice. So what are you seeing? Why? What pushed you out of the of the party or why did you leave? After I came off the presidential trail, Charlie, in 2020, I still felt despondent about the direction of American politics. So I dug in and tried to figure out why I felt that way. And what I determined was that we are failing and this system is designed to fail us because of the broken incentives that so many people already know all too well. Uh, we are careening towards disaster. And the only way out of the disaster is systemic reform that 
can come from a positive unifying third party and just about nothing else. So I'm a patriot. I looked up and said, okay, I've been a Democrat, but I do not believe that the Democratic Party uh, can cure this particular disease because they're embedded and benefit from this system. In a two-party system, it is completely unrealistic to expect one party, let's call it the Democratic Party, to win every national race from now until the end of time, given that 88% of Americans think we're on the wrong track. People who say, like, Democrats will save democracy are making arguments that don't make sense to me, honestly, because you're like, wait, let me get this straight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, your plan is just to defeat Republicans everywhere, like, until the end of time. I mean, this system is uniquely susceptible and vulnerable to authoritarianism without meaningful reform. So when people talk about me leaving the Democratic Party, it was for this mission. And if anyone wants to dig into my thinking, I did write a book about it. This is not something that I just arrived at. Uh, you know, it, it's based upon the thinking uh, and writings of Lee Drutman, Jonathan Haidt, Ezra Klein, Catherine Gale, Lawrence Lessig. If you actually figure out what the heck is happening, this approach is the only rational approach. The only problem is that we have these media organizations that benefit economically from setting us down our tribal paths and setting us against each other. And so then when you actually point out the real problems, uh, again, they're like, oh, wait, like, even though that's the truth, like, we don't like these narratives because we par we parrot these other narratives all the live long day. So that's why I left the Democratic Party to fix the real problems. OK, let, let me push back on that. So Joe Biden was elected because he ran as a centrist. So there will be those who will argue that the Democratic Party's you know, beating heart is they are the centrist party. And the, the Democrats have come out in favor of many of the reforms that you are describing, that they are already pro reform. How do you answer that? Charlie, what I would say is just look to the state of Nevada a ballot initiative for open primaries and ranked choice voting. So Democrats must be for it, right? Of course not, because they think it's against their political okay. interests. They're spending seven figures to fight it. You know, they're boosting election denying extremists in various elections, including toppling Peter Meyer, who voted to impeach Trump. So when the Democrats say it's like, oh, we're saving democracy, it's like, no, you're a political party. You're going to do what's in your best interest, whether that's fighting open primaries and ranked choice voting in Nevada, whether that's kicking the Greens off the ballot in North Carolina, whether that's spending money boosting Doug Mastriano and Peter Meyer's opponent, whose name, thankfully, I don't know, but I guess I'll have to learn. John so, Gibbs. <laughs> you know I mean? And the other thing, too, is that like true reform cannot come from within the system. I mean, like anyone who knows anything about organizations know that, uh, you know, you're going to need some other force driving that change. So, Governor, you mentioned a little while ago that many of the blue dog Democrats are not faring well. It is interesting to watch the progression of both political parties. I know that people are not going to engage in both sides, isn't, but both political parties have over the last several decades been purging their moderates and their, and their, their centrists. Um, I mean, not, not completely, but after this midterm election, the ranks of centrist Democrats might have been thinned out even more. What do you think? It's scary. And I, I hear that and I can see that happening because the parties control the system so tightly. And also, you know, democracy doesn't ask a lot of us, but it does ask us to be informed and to vote. And too often when people were, have been presented with these choices chosen by the far right or the far left, and they're choosing not to express their opinion at the polls, they don't vote at all. And that is the wrong response. And what we're saying is, look, you can come together. If you're a Democrat and you've got a, a far left Democrat versus a centrist Republican, vote Republican. If you're a Republican with a nutcase on the right versus a centrist Democrat, vote Democrat. Put the party aside and do what's best for the nation. We've seen this thing coming. I would have had to change the title of my book, 2005. It's my party, too. Uh, but I did mention what was I thought was going to happen to the Republican Party and how bad I thought it was going to be. And there's no satisfaction. I told you so. But it's there. And we need to recognize that. And as Andrew's been saying, this is a whole different approach based on what the public wants and making people feel comfortable that they can be a Republican or a Democrat or an independent and a member of the forward party. They can come to the forward party and agree to the holistic goals. We're not asking you to change that. Yeah, the, the issues are not the same on both sides, but I've been through two Democratic primaries and the Democratic primary voters 
are not necessarily the same as the general public. So the distortions are different, but the distortions are very much active on both sides. Well, the Democratic primary voter may not be the same as the general election voter, but but also, and this is a critique made by people like Reed Teixeira and David Shore and others, and we'll talk about the Democrats for a moment here, that there seems to be a gap between the rank and file Democratic voter who tends to be more middle of the road and the professional elite class of consultants and staffers in the Democratic Party who tend to be college educated, uh, upper income and far, far, far more progressive than the average voter. Do you see that as a problem? Is, is that been one of the issues that Democrats have been struggling with? The fact that there's a disconnect between their professional elites and their own rank and file? I ran for president in Iowa, Ohio, and other states, and I would say, hey, running for president. And then a waitress at a diner would say, what party? And then I would say Democrat, and she would flinch. She'd go, oh, like she'd blanch away. And I related this story and said, look, something has gone wrong with the Democratic Party if a working class person who we're supposed to be representing has that reaction. And it's a problem. You know, like the, the... Democratic Party seems like it's gotten more concerned with policing various expressions and cultural issues than improving that waitress's life. Like, and you're going to end up polarizing the country and losing if if that is the predominant message, which I agree is being driven by people whose experiences are vastly dissimilar from that waitress in that diner. Well, and another thing, and I think, Governor, you were getting at this, there, there once was a time not that long ago when there was a pretty robust diversity of views in both political parties. And now it it feels that there is much more pressure for everyone to line up for the whole buffet, that you don't get to pick and choose. It's like, if you are a Republican, you must believe all of these things. If you are a Democrat, you must believe all of these things. And and that really is constraining. Is that one of the, the reasons why you are talking about a party without a specific kind of platform here? Because you know, having seen, and I'm formulating this as I'm talking here, the lockstep, you must you know check every single box mentality that we have right now between Democrats and Republicans. Absolutely, Charlie. That's precisely what it is. And as I started to say earlier, I'm trying to think back to when it really started to change because the party platforms didn't used to be that uh, specific on various issues. They made it open so that people could feel that they were they could be either side of the issue and still be within the umbrella or the the big tent. My father always called, and I thought this was a very good analogy, actually. Parties were like umbrellas. You had a a handle, central core, which was a shared philosophy. Then you had the ribs, which were different ways of interpreting those philosophies, but they were all under the same canopy. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're going to develop. That's what the forward party is going to be about, saying you can be comfortable here as a liberal, as a conservative, as a moderate, because we're not going to agree on every issue. And we're not going to try to force you to say that you have to be 100% one way or another on any issue. And yet, isn't there something about human nature that wants to be part of a tribe where they're surrounded by people who will agree with their priors, who will not challenge them? Because what you're asking is for people to get in a room who may have very, very different values and somehow work together, which is an ideal but it's certainly not what we've seen happening in American politics over the last decade. Charlie, this is the joy. This is the wonder. <laughs> right. Seriously, like, where where uh, Christine and I have been in rooms with people that don't agree with us and found them to be lovely and delightful, positive, optimistic, warm. And I'm going to say that the Forward Party's first national convention is going to be comprised of that spirit. It's wonderful. And when you talk about people needing to join a tribe, you're exactly right. This is the tribe of people who can agree to disagree, who are rational, who want to solve the problems, who don't want to succumb to the he said, she said morality play that the media uh, and uh, our legislators are currently engaged in that's not actually improving our lives or, or the lives of of those in our community. I mean, the reason I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, Charlie, is that this is the bulwark community. Mm -hmm. It's the forward community. This is our tribe. This is the tribe that America needs and has been waiting for. And let's build it together because we're running out of time. 
You made a reference before that the media is invested in this duopoly. Why is that, do you think, Andrew? Why has the media decided that it has a vested interest in kind of looking askance at alternatives to the duopoly? It's one reason why people love you and the bulwark, Charlie, but uh, we all know the answer. It's just money. I mean, you're in a challenging media environment. You discover that giving people what they want um, makes them tune in and be loyal and click and buy things. So that's where you head. And you double down and triple down on that. You hire people that are very much subscribers to that ideology or at least willing to pretend to be <laughs> when, when, when the yeah. cameras are on. Uh, and, and that's where your bread is now buttered. If you try to go the other direction, the market pommels you. Uh, I mean, if if there's one basic thing that I'm fighting uh, in my life now, Charlie, it's, it's, it's the thing that's ruining America, is that market incentives have just grown to overrun any kind of positive goodwill or human nature, whether that's in our media, the political incentives, like, like we, we have this master market intelligence that has taken over our media and social media. And you are literally the bulwark against it, Charlie. It's one reason, again, I'm so pumped to be here because like this is uh, one of like the havens of reason. <laughs> Uh, but 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 we know we know exactly why these media companies are doing what they're doing. It, it, it's for the money. And Charlie, you've seen with the bulwark and the response you've gotten to the bulwark and the the people that have signed up to the bulwark. It, that's that's our those are our people. Those are the people we're talking about, and they're there because they respect the fact that you do do uh, both sides. I mean, you will you will put up stuff that uh, is going to infuriate some people one day and make them very happy the next. So you've you've hit that medium in the middle there that is if so appealing and you're seeing it tr- the traction you've gotten but Andrew's absolutely right if you're in this competitive environment where everything matters about how many people are driven to your particular site and you try to broaden it it's difficult it's tough and if you're part of the major media you don't have a chance and so we keep getting fed these things on the extremes and but that's why the bulwark is so popular. Well, I appreciate the praise, um, you know. But the reality is, of course, that we are we're a, you know, a niche market, and what you're describing is is a, is a marketplace that is hostile to that sort of thing, which also then creates a political uh, problem. But I really appreciate uh, all of the time you have spent with us, uh, Governor Christy Todd Whitman, Andrew Yang, uh, the co-chairs of Forward, a new national political party. Thank you so much for joining me on the Bulwark Podcast today. Charlie, thank you. Let's go build it. And as we build this new third-party movement, we should invest in independent media so Americans can actually Mm -hmm. get rationality, truth, not spun with ideological and partisan narratives. There should be Bulwark times a thousand. We should, uh, you know, (laughs) Bulwark should be the new CNN or whatever the heck, you know, because you're fighting the market the same way we are, but this is what the people want, the people need. Let's team up. You're going to be broadcasting interviews, hopefully with people like that are even more exciting than me (laughs) and the governor at the Forward Party National Convention, summer 2023. Come join us on tour. Kicks off in Houston, Texas, September 24th. Forwardparty.com. Let's go, Charlie. The bulwark against authoritarianism indeed. (laughs) Andrew Yang, from your lips to God's ear. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow. Do this all over again. You loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Last night, Lisa wanted to clean out the fridge. And I was like, I can't lift anything. I'm not helping. Number one, Lala was told she can't lift anything, you guys. So it's not like she's just like, I'm not lifting anything. She no, but I'm told. not helping. But even, just, my, even my friends know. I'll write you a check. I'll okay. do some Venmo. I'll have something wired. <laughs> I am not helping. I don't like it. Give Them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.